the subject of, of today's seminar is something that is, is very important and touches the heart of uh, what this knowledge is for and uh, why it's here. Um, and the human beings, uh, human beings are conditioned in so many different ways. Um, if you come to a basic understanding of human design, you get to see that we're all open to conditioning regardless of the nature of our design, that each and every one of us have receptors to, to what we are not. Um, if you look at family analysis and uh, you begin to examine the nature of the penta, you begin to see that the way in which we're actually conditioned, the way in which um, we operate in the world is very much governed by the the penta aura and that aura uh, and the way in which the penta operates is that it seeks homogenization that is uh, it it seeks the ability not to stand out and be different it is one of the things about the nature of conditioning that is so devastating um, it, it is my serendipity that having a, a totally individual design, um, you know, that it was obvious to me that the standards by which uh, everybody seemed to operate or everybody was supposed to operate simply just didn't work for me. Um, I, I guess the first time I truly understood that was the nature of my mind because my mind is entirely unconscious. I have no active participation. And yet, uh, throughout my school days, uh, the conditioning was that you work with your mind, that you make up your mind, and so forth and so on. And what happens is that we live in a world in which the conditioning forces are the most attractive. I mean, this is the sadness of what it is to be not-self. That is, uh, for the not-self, everything, everything that it's not is a possibility of what it could be. And so the not-self is forever, you know, seeking its relationship with any harmonic connection, any, any kind of connection in the end that will provide it with what it does not have consistently. And so we end up in a world where everybody is seeking homogenization. Everybody. And when I say everybody is seeking homogenization, this is how societies function. This is how the not-self civilization works. It works in the way in which we are conditioned, propagandized, the way in which we are molded. And whether we are being molded by uh, the religious values of whatever religion it happens to be or the political values of whatever political system it's supposed to be, we are constantly being homogenized. We are being homogenized by universal presentations of information. We are being homogenized in the way in which languages are actually spoken. Um, we're being homogenized at so many levels. Excuse me. Um, being homogenized at all these levels, what we end up with is that we end up with a planet that is simply not self, doesn't function properly. And in fact, the, the very nature of being on this planet is the ultimate expression of suffering. So, what has this got to do with parenting? I had this extraordinary experience not too long ago. I had a visit, and a uh, mother and a child. And supposedly the child had problems. So interesting, this projection. You know, I've had a, a favorite saying for so many years that, you know, people in white hats doing black work. I mean, it's really nice that you love your children. It does not mean that you're being a, an advantage for them in this life at all. The fact that you love them truly, in a sense, doesn't really mean anything. It is the knowing of them. And here was this child. And uh, here was this child with a very powerfully defined throat. Uh, I think there was three definitions to the throat, but all of them were unconscious. And they were all unconscious. So this was a child that was very, very hesitant to say anything. I mean, think about how frightening it is when you have a throat that operates unconsciously and you don't know what it's going to say. You don't say very much. And the things you say tend to blurt out. So here is this parent, and this parent looks at this child and says, this child's not normal. It's not normal. It's not like other children. It doesn't talk enough. You know, I was born in uh, 1948 after the war, and there was a phenomenon in North America, and that was the phenomenon of Dr. Spock. 
and uh, you know everybody, uh, every mother of the post-war baby boom read this damn book. And of course, they're all homogenized through the penta. I mean, you know, if you live in a neighborhood where mo one mother is reading Spock, you end up reading Spock, everybody ends up reading Spock, and you all end up doing the same things. And you end up with these very rigid measurement systems. You know, when's Johnny or Janie going to walk, talk, you know, whatever the case may be. All of these various measurements that we're all terrified about as parents. I mean, after all, this is one of the things about being so unaware and being so unaware of mechanics. You know, it's one of those things when I deal with parents, for example, have a child with an undefined throat, baby. You know, I say, look, don't worry. I mean, don't worry when things happen because they can happen very early uh, or they could happen on time or they could happen very late but there's no control over that because there's no consistency in the metamorphic program now having an understanding of your child is one thing but recognizing how addicted you are to being homogenized how addicted you are to being homogenized. So here is this parent with this child, and this child's got a throat problem. But it's more than that. The child's a 3955. And of course, 3955s are emotional beings who are individual and melancholic. You know, so the child is depressed. So guess what the child gets? The child gets drugs, antidepressants. I mean, the child gets antidepressants. Why does the child get antidepressants? Because you're not supposed to be melancholic. I mean, give me a break, you know? If you're individual, you're melancholic. You know, and instead of the melancholy actually becoming something that could be fertile and creative and beautiful, which is the potential out of any individuality, instead of that it becomes, a, you know, a kind of driven distaste and discomfort with being in the world. So here you have this parent, and it's got this child, it's a 3955, and of course it has eating peculiarities. Well, individuals are like that. They do have eating peculiarities, particularly 3955s. They just do. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. Doesn't mean they're strange that they don't like to eat this, that, and the other thing that everybody else seems to adore. You know, these are the kind of children that parents worry about them because they don't like ice cream. What's wrong with them, you know? What's the matter with them? Everybody, every kid likes ice cream. What's wrong with you? And you have to see, mm, it is so powerful, the conditioning of the family penta and its relationship to the world around it. You want your children to be, quote, unquote, normal. And actually what you're saying is, you want your children to be well homogenized, just as far up as everybody else's children. And you see, parenting is about awareness. It's about awareness. The magic of human design is human design is the science of differentiation. Differentiation. It's what's so special about this knowledge is that it gives you a blueprint of what makes you different, what makes you unique, what makes your child different and your child unique. It's not about looking at your child's design and saying, ooh, they're going to have problems with this in school. We better give them, color this in. You know, this is going to be a problem. The reality is that when you look at the nature of your child and you look at their design, what you're seeing is them. <laughs> not what you want them to be. Not what you want them to be because of the pressure, mostly unconscious, the pressure that is there through the penta, that pressure that's driving you that you don't want to be embarrassed by the difference of your child. And uh, all these generalized false standards that have been raised about what is healthy in a child. Nothing has disturbed me more over the years. Nothing has disturbed me more than to see the relationship between parents and children where the parents simply do not see the child. They see what they think are symptoms of something that's the matter instead of seeing the normality of the child. Not only seeing it, but to embrace it. You know, you got all these people in the New Age running around screaming about their purpose. I mean, give me a break. How are you going to fulfill your purpose when you're so deeply homogenized in this world? 
that there is no real differentiation. And the first dilemma that we have in parenting is that we don't, parents don't see their differentiated child. Uh, and by the way, when I step out like that, it's just that I, I, I'm, I'm coughing, actually. They don't see their differentiated child. I mean, it's a horror. And what do you do, you know? The, the child that has the undefined emotional system. You know, here's the child with the undefined emotional system, and you've got a parent that's got a defined emotional system, so the child's going to rock it back and forth emotionally. You know, and the child's going to learn to avoid confrontation, and it's going to sneak away, and it's not going to tell everything that's true, and so forth and so on. Parents think the child has a problem. I mean, they think the child has a problem. They think the child has an emotional problem. And the child doesn't. And because the parents are convinced that the child has to be homogenized, you know, like all these other so-called normal children who are all deeply homogenized. I mean, how many children do you have in America now that are drugged? And I don't mean with recreational drugs. You know, the kinds of drugs that are so disorienting and, and, and detrimental to the development of these human beings. And it's just about seeing their design. It isn't about anything more profound than that. I mean, tonight I'll give you examples from many perspectives of the kinds of things that are important to pay attention to. But, you know, aside from the things of type and, you know, profile and open centers, it begins with the consciousness. I mean, this is about awareness. It isn't about anything else. It's about awareness. You know, the moment that you can see clearly the differentiated potential of your child, then how can you not do anything but support that uniqueness? Regardless, regardless of what the neighbors say. I had this wonderful experience when we were living in, uh, in Bavaria in southern Germany. And it's a rather conservative environment. And we were living in you know, a little uh, kind of suburb. Well, I mean, the whole town is tiny. I mean, you know, just a little edge of it. And um, my eldest son, he had befriended local kids. And um, we stayed there for uh, nearly two years. And uh, both of uh, my sons are generators. And they truly have never really had a bedtime. Um, you know, they're generators. It's very unhealthy for, for generators to put, be put to sleep, you know, this kind of thing where, you know, you, you tell your generator who's seven years old that they, they have to go to bed at, at 7.30 because you want to have a quiet evening in front of the TV or whatever. I mean, the reality is that that is so detrimental to their physical well-being. It is so unhealthy for them as sacral beings. They're motor beings, after all. You know, they're here to go to sleep when they're exhausted, and obviously that can be very trying. Uh, they are generators, and they do buzz, and uh, but ultimately they they find their own realistic uh, time in which they they you know go to sleep. So here I was in this conservative community where where my son at the time I don't know what he was he must have been around ten or eleven years old, and uh, you know his friends had to go to bed at eight o'clock. I mean, they just had to go to bed at 8 o'clock. You know, go to bed, which meant at 7.30, they had to get ready to go to bed, you know, and blah, 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 and that was it. You know, and there was, uh, there was my son, and, you know, he would go to sleep at 11 o'clock. And uh, obviously these kids kept on saying to their parents, you know, but how come, you know, he, you know, gets to go to bed so late? And eventually, of course, they, they, they began to ask, you know, and of course they were very concerned that this was terribly unhealthy. I mean, it's not homogenized, you know. We all put our children to bed at the same time because they're supposed to get a certain number of hours of sleep and blah, 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 and all this stuff, you know. And I mean, the pressure is enormous. And you have to see that when you have children, there is this enormous pressure from the communities that you're a part of. It's just there. It's pressure. This is the way in which the penta operates. And so we have difficulties with these children that are differentiated, particularly the ones that are differentiated to any kind of extreme. And obviously when you're dealing with parents who are not self, you know, their responses, their reactions to the way in which their child is, is behaving, you know, all of this just adds, you know, fuel to the fire. It's a mess. I mean, it's a real mess. And it's all about 
recognizing that we are different. That child that I was talking about earlier with the unconscious throat and the 3955, if that child was in my care for a couple of weeks, just just a couple of weeks, you know, and it's not about I would spend a hell of a lot of time doing parenting because I don't, you know, and I watch my children and they watch me and I guess that's the way we learn from each other. Uh, but it's clear that if you treat somebody according to their nature and that you see their differentiation as being what's special about them rather than what the problem is, it's very easy to transform a life, particularly a young life, because they know and they want to know and they're interested and they care. Nothing more beautiful than a child interested in design. Nothing more beautiful. You know, I had one of those moments the other day with my, my little son who suddenly out of nowhere wants to see his design. It's a real delight. You know, and to be able to bring this sense of uniqueness into our lives. We're so used to being homogenized. You know, we're so used to wanting to be like the thing that we're not. You know, we're so driven by our genetics in that way that, that we don't see what we're doing to our very children. And it's all about recognizing they're unique, so let them be unique. Nurture it. Nurture it. This is what we need if we don't have a generation of human beings. I mean, after all, think about your own process, all of you. You know, you, you come to this knowledge in the middle of your lives. You know, that means you've got to clean out years and years and years and years of garbage. It's not an easy thing to do. All that conditioning, all that homogenization, all that work, you know. The point about this knowledge is, yes, there has to be early generations that take this in and will take it in as it has been intellectually and slowly begin to bring it into practice and slowly be able to bring it to their children. But the reality is that it's our children that can most easily benefit by this. If you raise your children according to their nature, they're not going to have to get into the deconditioning business. They're going to begin, they're going to work through their life being able to see how to make decisions correctly as themselves. And it's not about hammering them. I don't propagandize my children, I never have. You know, it's not about that. It's not about trying to be the great positive conditioning force. I want to be there to be able to remind them of their uniqueness. This is my job. If I can constantly remind them of their uniqueness, if I can reward their uniqueness, if I can provide them with keys that are necessary for them in making decisions in their life, I've done a great job. Because that's the whole point. You know, it's not about when do we start, you know, because it isn't about when do we start. It, it, it's about it happening. You see, I live a human design life. You know, this is just the way it is. And and you learn to see that there is a timing for all of these things. The work isn't so much the work that you do directly in communication in the educational sense with your child. It's the transformation of your awareness and your resistance, your resistance to the forces around you who will not like what you're doing. And they won't. And it's the first thing you're going to see. It's the first thing that you'll notice. And when you notice it, I remind you of the power of the penta. Because that's what you're feeling. You know, if you have a neighborhood, you know, one of, one of these suburban neighborhoods, um, and you've got one family that, you know, the, they don't paint their house regularly. Uh, you can hear them arguing at night. Um, slowly but surely, everybody in that neighborhood begins to put out an energy of ostracization towards this family until ultimately they move. You know, th there is nothing. There is nothing that, you know, family pantas can't stand more than a family that operates differently until there's critical mass. Until there's critical mass. But you know, that's not going to happen overnight. It's a real job. And that you have to see that the moment that you recognize your child's uniqueness, you have to see that that child is going to carry the power of your recognition of that into their lives. Into their lives. 
you know, so that they're in the school environment and they say, you know, you're making me upset, you know, I'm I'm going out of your aura, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, th- there are all kinds of beings that your children are going to deal with that have no way and no chance of grasping what's really going on. They're not. And your children are going to feel the difference. You see, it's quite a thing, mutation. I mean, it's quite a thing. See, for most human beings, awareness is incredibly selfish. It's one of the things I've always found so distasteful about people who sought out enlightenment. I mean, I can't think of anything more selfish. You know? Because it's so personal. It's so selfish. It's only about them. It's only about them. This knowledge is not about the personal. It's the magic of human design. The first thing you can truly grasp about this knowledge is that if you grasp what a passenger is, you can see that this whole life is an enormous impersonal thing. But it's life. It's consciousness. You see, for me, to be able to bring this knowledge to others is what makes it so magical. I mean, that's what's magical, that it's transferable. That you can awaken your children. It's a hell of a lot more important than you waking up at least from my perspective. You know, we need children to be awakened. I mean, they're going to carry the energy into the future. They're the humans that are going to have to deal with the great mutation of 2027. They're the ones who are going to have to live in a world that's radically going to be different. And their ultimate equipment, because it is the age we're moving into, we're moving into a six-line age, You know, the equipment that they need is the ability to act as independent role models as themselves in an age that's going to demand that they operate correctly as themselves. And this is what we're here to give our children, is their own authority. I mean, their own authority. It's it's the first thing that I, I really grasped when uh, my my little son, uh, his birth was an emergency, and I actually saw his design um, within, oh, 15 minutes of his actual birth, but I didn't see him. Um, and it was an extraordinary thing. I had this uh, epiphany in that moment, this... I I could see this unique being had just emerged and and fortunately I could see that it was powerful enough that it would survive its ordeal because he was very premature. And I, I saw the magnificence of that pure power that was there in that vehicle. I saw the vehicle so clearly in that moment. And I understood something so very basic that he's got to keep that power all his life. He can't ever give it up. You know, this is what I care about. I care about that every single human being, every child that comes into this world, is taught that they can have their own authority. Their own authority. I mean, that's what it's all about. You know, and of course, this is one of the great fears of parents. I mean, it's only in the last hundred years or so The children have universally stopped being chattel, but in most places they still are. In most places they are still property. I mean, you get less time in prison for, you know, killing your child than you do for killing a neighbor. You know, it's really insane. I mean, it's really insane. And you see, for me, the whole thing is to embrace the uniqueness of your child. I mean, all this concern about, uh, you know, child psychiatry and... uh, child therapy and all of these drugs and all of these things that human beings are doing to their children. And this is the West. I mean, I don't want to talk about the third world and it's an enormous abuse of children one way or another. Um, It's got to be clear to you that this is a question of consciousness. Yeah, I will give you nice techniques, but really, you have to grasp this is about consciousness. It's about being aware And it's about seeing that the moment that you have the gift, it's a gift to be able to see the design of your children, your friends' children, your grandchildren, whatever it may be, that in that gift of being able to see them, you can give them something very special. 
you know, you can give them a guidance that will enrich the rest of their lives and will allow them to stay within themselves despite what the world around them is. This is what it's all about. You know, it's like when I do the the daily forecasts on Jovian Radio and I talk about, you know, what the weather really is all about. You know, the weather is for the not-self. You know, the vast majority of the planet, whatever whatever is being dictated by the program they're living out. So here we are in a time of the nodes in the 5157, and we've got all these shocks and fear for survival, and we got all this stuff because it's just the background. But you know, if you're operating correctly, it doesn't make any difference what it is. It doesn't. This is the way we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be ruled by the program. We're not here for that. We're here to express our uniqueness in our relationship with the world around us. And it's only when more and more and more of us express our uniqueness that we will really begin to expand the consciousness of this planet. How can you expand consciousness when, you know, you end up with 200 million people watching the same thing every day? The reflection of what their life is supposed to look like and what they're supposed to have and not have and the way they're supposed to look and not look the way they're supposed to be and not be, the way children are supposed to be, the way they're supposed to behave, you know, all of these things. The obvious when you're dealing with children, there are two things that are very obvious. We're dealing with type, we're dealing with profile, and we're dealing with their not-self. That is, we're dealing with the open centers where they can be influenced. And when you're dealing with those three areas, you know, these are the three keys of being able to look at them, you know, and to be able to see the methodology in dealing with them. You know, it's just about nurturing them in a positive way, in that sense, towards their nature. It's not always easy. Like anything else in the life process, it can be very complex. You know, it's not the easiest thing to keep on asking a generator child to do something. It's not. It can be very frustrating because, after all, that's what the generator can produce in the environment. But one of the real magical things to look at when you look at the design of your children is look at their nodes. I want you to grasp something. We all see the world through different eyes. And this is more important than just about anything to grasp about our uniqueness. You know, I've been doing this series on the nodes, and it's been a long time since I've given them the attention they deserve. And I realize in this day and age of the knowledge that they're more important now than ever before because the rest of the information is there. Think about what the nodes really represent. They represent the way in which you see the world. Not the way in which the world is, but the way in which you see it. So if you come into the world with the nodes we have now, somebody being born now, they will come into a world in which they will see the concerns for survival in the 57. They will see the shocks. They will be sensitive to these things in their life. And one of the things you get to recognize right away with your relationship to your children is look at the nodal relationships. See, often you don't see the world at all in the same way. And and again, remember that You know, particularly looking at the personality, because obviously when you're dealing with the personality, you're dealing with who the person thinks they are, that their perspectives are different. You know, think about the the parent that has a child that's on the cross of the plane, as an example. You know, that not on the cross of the plane, but pardon me, just has the 636, just that arm. You know, crisis, conflict. Here's a child that sees crisis and everything. Here's a child that sees crisis in the world. Here's a child that's always seeing the problems. And the parents say, geez, I'm so worried. You know, my child's not happy. You know, I show them this thing and I think it's going to please them and they see the other. And then the parent wants to fix the child. And the child isn't designed to see any other way. They see the world they're given to see based on who they are. The magic, the magic of what I originally called the cross of life, eh? the sun, earth, and the south and north known. The magic of this is that you only get to live out your profile and its purpose, you know, when you can see the world the way you're intended to see it. Because that's where your unique gifts lead you And it's through seeing the world with those eyes that you get to fulfill your purpose. 
It's just the way that it is. And yet, unless you recognize this, you can jump to all kinds of assumptions. I mean, there are so many assumptions that parents make about their children that is simply just not so. And it's not so because they just simply do not understand their matrix. They do not understand the way in which they are simply designed. So let's begin with type. I think type is, you know, the, the obvious in the sense that this is the first step in relaxing the aura of the child. It's relaxing the aura of the child. It is creating a resonance for that aura. And so, for example, let's begin with the manifester. Um, we know that, that manifestors are very unusual because the strategy of the manifester is not real. Um, and, and if you're surprised by that, you've just missed a lot of lectures. But nonetheless, it's not real. And what I mean by that is that when we had the transition to the ninth centered being um, at the end of the 18th century, manifestors were dropped from the hierarchy. In other words, uh, projectors were placed on the ascendancy, generators were geared towards their transformation from slave to builder, and manifestor was going to go into uh, a kind of semi-retirement um, the fact is that a manifester without its strategies uh, is actually quite unfit to, to function successfully in, in the world as we have it today, particularly during the cross of planning time. It will be slightly easier for them um, beyond 2027 because the theme is extremely individual and, and uh, self-driven. However, um, in dealing with the manifestor child, the, the essential thing about the manifestor child is the need to recognize that they have to learn that they cannot just simply use their power when they like. You know, it's the greatest lesson that any manifestor can ever learn. It's the only lesson worth learning for a manifestor. And it's an essential teaching for the child. And basically what that comes down to is teaching the child to ask permission. In other words, you know, making sure that the child develops a, a sense of manners and timing. And one of the things that's very important about that with the manifestor is that the fact that they ask permission, the tendency of a non-manifestor parent with a manifestor child is to try to control them. And of course, this is taking place at the oral level, so it's not exactly something that they're necessarily conscious of. You know, the, the manifestor aura is one in which, you know, they are not necessarily trusted by the other types, and they're not trusted because they don't actually need the other type. Asking permission is not something that a manifestor needs to do. It's something they need to learn. And so, you know, the key in dealing with a manifestor child is that you simply have to say to them, look, okay, I know you can do that and you want to go out right now, but, you know, you can't just go out because then I'm going to worry about you, you're going to get punished, blah, 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 all these kinds of things. What it comes down to is asking me. Now, I may set parameters for you, you may not like it, you know, all of those things, but basically the manifestor has to learn to see that in order for them to get along with others, and it's about getting along with others, in order for them to get along with others, they have to learn how to ask permission. They have to learn how to control their own manifesting in that sense. And they have to learn to deal with the fact that there are going to be forces in their life that will control them. It's quite a lesson for the manifestor child to learn. It really is. But if you can manage to teach them the correctness of asking permission, they will have a much easier time in this life. And of course, as they move along and as they age, they can be given more and more information about what it means to be a manifestor and to be a manifestor child. What's really important about the manifestor child is that, you know, the manifestor child needs to be looked after in terms of their sleep pattern. And of course, this is true for all non-sacral beings. It's very important for non-sacral children um, to, to graduate into sleep and they're to be encouraged to get into bed and read a book, get into bed and you listen to music, get into bed and whatever, but to do so before they are exhausted. It is very dangerous to exhaust non-sacral children. 
I mean, it's just simply something to understand about their particular nature. And one of the things about healthy well-being is healthy sleep. And healthy sleep always brings me to one of the, the basic central themes of practical living your design. And that is that every human being not only has a right to be their own authority, they have a right to sleep in their own aura. Now, obviously, this can bring up questions about, you know, mothers and their and their babies and so forth and so on. And yes, there are graduated phases that one can take into account. Uh, n- sleeping in your own room doesn't mean that, you know, you can't break that rule once in a while. There are all kinds of things that are obvious. It's just about practicalities. But the real practicality, the most important thing is the privilege of your own space. I mean... Uh, you know, th- this is something always to consider if, if you're um, a, a basic penta that is three members, you know, parents and a child, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're planning uh, to have another child or, or, or you're pregnant. One of the things to consider is, yeah, it's very nice to think, okay, in the time being, we'll put the little one in our bedroom and uh, so forth and so on. But you really have to see that it, as part of that equation, you do need to have the extra room. Now, obviously, that involves economics and people's lives and so forth and so on, and all of these things become part of the equation. But really to recognize that the greatest privilege that you can give your child is to give your child its own room. I mean, this is something that is absolutely essential for their well-being. I mean, absolutely essential. See, if your child goes to sleep correctly in their own environment, they're going to wake up fresh and they're going to wake up healthy. This is what's so important. You know, they're going to wake up fresh, they're going to wake up healthy, they're going to wake up as themselves, they're going to emerge into the world and take the world in. You know, any child that has a room of their own, they know the magic of being able to escape into that room, to get out of the aura. I mean, I live with four generators right now. Four generators. I'm, I'm, I've got an open sacro. I mean, by the time I finish dinner with them, I I have to get out of the room. I mean, there's this buzz that's going on and these vibrating motors, and I'm taking it all in. And I go down into my space, and I sit quietly and have a cup of coffee, and I let my, you know, my sacral system clean out that vibration. And you can only do that if you have the privilege of your own space and that you have the respect for everyone's need for their own space. You know, that it's so important to realize this. So, of course, this is something that, you know, is just part of the practical mechanics of, you know, what it is to to live a life in which you can be your own authority. You can't afford to give away your authority during the, the unconscious eight hours approximately of your sleeping time, sleeping with somebody else who is filling up whatever open centers that they you know, connect for you and having to deal with all of that and having to deal with all that the next day. Not only that, but being conditioned to go to bed when somebody else does. You know, it's just another form of this homogenization that is so detrimental to our lives. We need to experience our uniqueness. The separate environment is an enormous advantage in the in being able to, to go through this experience. And it's also very important with the baby that, you know, as soon as it's possible to get this child into its own space so it starts taking in its own unique program. So with the manifester, you know, the key is that it is a task because it's not natural. In other words, uh, this is something that simply the manifester needs to learn in order to be able to live a better life socially in the world, which is going to be so important as it is for all of us. But when you're dealing with the generator, you're dealing with the most natural, the most natural of all the strategies. There is no more natural strategy. It is exactly what the sacral center is. It is the great responding machine. It is precisely what it is. It is the response to life itself. It is the life maker. It's magic. And of course, the moment that you're dealing with a sacral being and you're dealing with, you know, 68% of of, of the human population, you know, then you see right away that if we're going to change the world, it's these sacral babies, these sacral children that carry the magic. Because they can change the world with every breath. As long as the breath they take is a differentiated breath, that it's them. That it's them. And yes, you know, the generator needs to know two things in this life. 
The first thing that they need to know is that the sounds that they make from the moment that they come out of the womb are sounds that are going to be respected. I mean, respected. You know the magic of parents when they understand a baby before it can speak? You know the sounds it makes? You listen next time to a generator baby. They're really incredible. They've got a huge tonal vocabulary that immediately disappears the moment the homogenization of a throat world takes over. You know, parents are very concerned, very concerned that, you know, the the generator child, you know, the, very concerned that they have to articulate. You know, when is my baby going to talk? You know, when are they going to speak? You know, I mean, it is one of those things that's so amazing, you know, that you have this enormous pressure. Here's parents that supposedly love their children, right? Enormous pressure for this vast majority of generators. And the statistics, by the way, come from the Human Resource Center from our global survey where we have over 62,000 entries. And based on 62,000 entries, it's about 68%. You have all these parents conditioning their children through the throat. Be throat, be throat, we want you to talk, we want you to talk. When are you going to talk? Uh-uh. Are you going to talk? Uh-uh. Come on, talk, you know? There's the baby gooing and gawing, and it's really sweet, and they're saying thousands of wonderful things, and they'll respond to whatever it is that you offer them. They're really amazing. And then we do this whole number on their throat. And not only that, how deeply propagandized, deep, deep, deep in the psyche, has everybody been propagandized by the manifester way? Do this, do that. As if everybody can just do this, do that. There is nothing that a generator child hates more than being forced or told to do anything. They hate it. Think about the baby, you know, and you stick the nipple in the generator baby's mouth. Not happy. Not happy. But if you hold it in front of them, would you like some? You know. Oh, yeah. Happy. Very content. Respected as a being. It starts very early. It starts with understanding that the generator is here to be respected. You know, they are. You have to see that they require you to take the first step. You know, they require it because you is just, you know, They require it, however it manifests itself, to take the first step so that they can respond. And you see, the moment that you have a generator child and you spend your time asking them rather than telling them, they resonate. They are so much healthier as beings. And it's not like they always agree. I know, I deal with it all the time, I deal with it every day in my parenting. You know, you you want the child to do something, and you go, could you? <laughs> and you get no response, and, you know, would you like to? And uh, it would really be nice if you could, uh, could you? Uh, you know, and you go through this process until, of course, with children, you might get to the point where you say, well, look, you have to do it, you know, and you get annoyed, and whatever the story is. It's not about, you know, it, it, it's about understanding what comes first. Respect comes first. And to respect their sounds. And to let them know that you respect their sounds. So that when you ask them something and they go, "Mm mm-hmm, you don't need to say, what did you say? Yeah? You know, I mean, to get the the whole verbal process to come out of them. You see, if you accept that they're different, if you accept their differentiation, it's easy for them. But the moment you want them to be something they are not, You shatter their whole process and you enter them into the world of the not-self. And as you all well know, it's a world that's very, very hard to escape. Oh, there's a million 3955 stories. My my favorite was the meeting of my little 3955 when he was about... Uh, he was about four years old, and, and he met Teresa, who's, who's in the class tonight. And Teresa's a 3955, and he was immediately attracted to her, and he went over to her, and he said to her, first we dance, and then we eat. And I thought, now, there, there's a great 3955 romance for you.
in looking at the the non-energy types uh, again uh, the one thing about a generator that is is you know forcibly raised to be a manifester is that they are an energy type and despite their frustration you know, <coughs> pardon me they they end up being able to uh, you know to sort of satisfy their 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 parents and uh, their parents expectations about you know you, you've got to get up there and do it and get the work done and whatever but you know the moment you get to a non-energy type it's it it is literally cruel um nobody is open to deeper conditioning than a projector and uh, uh the fact is that it's so different for a reflector and I'll talk about that in a moment nobody's you know more open to deep deep conditioning within the penta within the family life than the projector and uh, the projector child has to latch on to the energy systems around it. I mean, after all, it's an essential in its life that it is connected to particularly the generating force in life. Uh, it means it's, it's conditioned almost automatically to be very dependent on, you know, the, the generative capacity. And it's very difficult for projectors ever truly to let go of that very early conditioning. It is so important that the projector child is recognized as the one you teach. And this is what makes the real difference in terms of the way in which you can be a positive force in their lives and show them respect. Uh, when you're dealing with energy types, when you're dealing with manifestors and generators, as you would with an adult being introduced to design, you know that they, they really have this... Um, yeah, they have this ability to be able to see the reality of the advantages immediately. They have a way of experimenting with it immediately because that's what they are, their energy types. When you're dealing with the projector, uh, the fact is that you're not going to spend all of your time inviting your child. Uh, it's not, it really isn't what it's about. Oh, you may invite them to certain things, but you're, you know, you're not going to invite them to, to clean up their room necessarily or go to the toilet necessarily. There's a lot of things about, you know, waiting for an invitation that is simply not pragmatic or realistic in, 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 in the lives of a projector if you match that against what it is for an energy type. You know, the strategy is something that is only, only truly there to be able to differentiate the life in its larger context. In other words, to be able to have the tools to make a decision for the major things in life, and those major things have to come by invitation. But it's very difficult to um, to work with your child. As a matter of fact, you'll see profiles a lot easier to deal with when you're dealing with a projector child because at least you understand the framework for their process. But the real difference is that where you don't need to teach, I, I have never been under pressure to teach my generator children design because, uh, you know, it's clear to me that when the time is right, they will respond. Uh, it's just there, and of course that has been the case. Um, but the thing to see with the projector child is you do have to teach them. And the beauty of that is they want to be taught. Now, you know, I often have parents say to me, you know, well, when's the right age to start teaching them? And obviously, this is one of those homogenization questions that has nothing to do with the differentiated being. You know, it's very important to see that, you know, the, the, the whole process of seeing our children, that we have to see their uniqueness. We have to see what differentiates with differentiates them and then hone our process to that differentiation. Uh, so in dealing with the projector child, one of the things that's very important to it is that the, it has visual contact with design. So, you know, you, you order one of these gorgeous posters that various organizations put out, you know, and, and instead of putting uh, Puff the Magic Dragon or some bunny rabbit or Mickey Mouse or whatever, put a body graph above their crib, you know, put a wheel up there, give them something really interesting to look at. You'll see that it's quite extraordinary. You see, they're designed to understand systems. They're designed to know, make sense of how, whatever language you want to use circuit-wise. They're here to grasp the nature of systems. And it is only when they begin to see that they can recognize the other through system that they begin to recognize themselves and they begin to be of value not only in their own lives to themselves but of value to others and so it's very important to teach the projector child and to teach them early early the earlier you teach them the more amazing they're going to be literally 
I mean, literally. You know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you introduce them at an early enough age, if you get them to really begin to grasp the mechanics, they will grasp the mechanics. If you take, for example, and by the way, when I say at a very young age, it's a progressive process. Uh, for me, it's possible for a projector child to understand human design by the time they have their first Saturn quarter. That would place them at about uh, seven and seven years, seven and a half years, something like that. Um, so for me, the projector child has this tremendous capacity to grasp it. it w when I look at a generator child, for me, the generator child is naturally going to respond to the knowledge sometime during the second Saturn quarter, that is between the age of seven and a half and uh, 15, approximately 15 years old, because the very conditions of their life are going to bring up circumstances that they need to resolve. And of course, only when you're beyond the first Saturn quarter do you really look out at the world as separate from yourself. You know, the first Saturn quarter is very different in that sense. But the projector has the tools. I mean, you know, understand the theme of, of the projector. The theme of the projector is to recognize and be recognized. And, of course, the, you know, to recognize that your child is a projector and to provide them with the opportunity of recognition. And, by the way, when I say that they are, you know, to be taught things early, I'm not just talking about, you know, human design, any kind of system. It doesn't matter what the system is. You know, th what is important for the projector is that they are given tools in order to be able to see their world in a way that others aren't trained to see it. I mean, no one is more natural for this work of being able to recognize the nature of another human being through their design than, than a projector. They, they have this capacity, and they have the, um, the drive within themselves to master systems. It's what they're here for. So when we're dealing with the projector child, we're dealing with something else. In most cases, the best way to treat your projector child on a day-to-day -day basis is as if they were a generator. And what I mean by that simply is that you ask them to respond. It's very good for them anyway, and it teaches them in the beginning that they need to get things coming to them before they assess them. You know, uh, uh, you know they can't be, t again, telling them what to do can leave them in a great deal of pain. And, and there's nothing worse than the pain of bitterness. You know, the bitterness that there is an expectation for what they are simply not capable of doing. But it's very important to get, the, get them used to the fact that they are here to react in that sense to what comes to them, that ultimately that is their greatest gift. But to bring them to that place, you bring them through education. So it's very, very important to remember that the projector child needs to be introduced to the knowledge early. They need to begin to see the mystery of the mechanics. And by the time they're able to actually read, you know, you have a child that can have a gift that would really astonish you. And this is one of the things that, you know, I, I have a vision of what is possible. Not what is likely, by the way, but certainly what is possible. And, uh, you know, until we have generations and generations of projector children who are recognized early enough and are trained early enough, you know, only then are we really going to have the masters of the system. And only then are we really going to have the ultimate combination that is here to transform humanity for its last stage on this planet. That is the transformation that can only be brought about by the symbiotic relationship between projectors and generators. And because generators are energy types, they are developing faster than projectors in terms of reaching a point of awakeness. In other words, uh, uh, you know, in, in the work that I've done over the many years, I, I've had a greater impact on, on generators than I've had on projectors, as an example, or at least what I can see. Um, I, I, and again, it's because they're an energy type and they have less conditioning to deal with. Also, the generator has this extraordinary gift of they have their authority within them that they can hear. I mean, they can hear it. It's there. You know, it, it's very different than what it is to be a projector. So the projector child needs to be educated. That brings me to the reflector child. And the reflector child is really kind of, well, it's, it's like what reflectors are themselves. There's this, this wonderful strangeness about these lunar beings. Um, you know, I, I began by talking about the power of homogenization, and particularly the power of the penta. And uh, one of the things to recognize about the, the reflector child is that when the reflector child isn't acting like everybody else, they have a problem. And it's perhaps the most interesting thing about them. 
you know, that is, they are here to be homogenized because the ho homogenization on a reflector never holds. It never holds. But they're here to breathe it all in. So if you're, you know, if you're a freak parent and you've got this little reflector child, this little reflector child, if you're living in a neighborhood, is going to be horrified about their parents, you know, embarrassed in that sense that they even have such parents. You know, in the moment that the, the mother or the father wants to, you know, put the child into a costume that the child is horrified at because it's going to be so different from everybody else's, you know, this is the kind of thing that really does damage. I mean, after all, when you're looking at a reflector, you're not looking at any defined authority. You're not. They have a, a totally different purpose that they're here to fulfill in this life. And so much of their purpose is about understanding that they are here to be like everyone else. And hopefully it's everyone else that changes. They're not going to change anything. They're here to be attuned to their environment. And so one of the things about raising a, a reflector child is to encourage its con conformity, in that sense, with others. Now, you know, the, the reflector child is going to feel happiest in that way. At a deeper level, at a deeper level, it's very important in dealing with the reflector child to understand their nodal environment because it is their nodal environment. This is the environment they are looking for all their life. Remember that this is the archetype of a design in which the self is always open. And so you're always looking for the theme of place. And of course, for the reflector child, they are always looking, particularly from the personality aspect of their node, they're always looking for a world that they can fit into perfectly. You know, when you normally look at somebody's nodes, they're not here to fit into that. They're here to use the way they see their environment as a way in which they can fulfill their purpose. But the reflector is here to be the environment. And so understanding their nodal environment, understanding the world, the, the way in which they, they see the world, is also important in understanding that this is the way they want to be. So let's say you have a reflector child that has the nodes, the 5157 that I discussed before. You know, this, this, this is a, a being that wants to have as much disorder and shock in their life as everybody else that they see. You know, that that's going to be what's natural for them to fit into that environment of fear for survival and, you know, all of these things that are part of that nodal framework. They're here to fit into that. So obviously raising a reflector child is quite different in that context where you're looking to nurture the differentiation in all the other types. You know, when it comes to the reflector child, what you're nurturing is the conformity with the, the culture and the environment that they belong to. Okay, so we've taken a look at the variations in terms of type. Now, one of the things that really makes a significant, you know, a real difference is the angle, because the angle says so much. Um, you know, it, it, we have uh, we have four variations in that sense of the way it could work. Actually, it's even more complex than that. But basically, we have variations in which, for example, one parent is is left angle and the child is right angle. It's an enormous gap. I mean, the parent realizes, and again, when I say realizes, uh, I only really mean this at a at a much deeper level that isn't necessarily touched at at the consciousness level. You know, the parent has a real connection, recognizes that force that's there in that child. You know, at the same time, the child looks at that parent and says, who are they? <laughs> and, and why are they here in my life? And, and, and should I be happy that they're here? You know, because it, the, the, the right angle is deeply self-absorbed. I mean, if you're a left angle person and you don't know that, you got a right angle child and you don't know that. You know, your impression of your child is that, you know, they, they don't really care for you that much, that, uh, you know, they're not really interested, that they're, they're selfish, that they're totally absorbed in their own process, that you're just there to provide them with service. Whew. You know, because that's where, you know, all that kind of mental movement goes in the not-self, because again, you know, we've got all these homogenized standards that we hold up as the way in which you know, we're supposed to see our children the way our children are supposed to be raised and the way they're supposed to perform in the world. 
And of course, if you have a left-angled child with a right-angled parent, the child says, you know, who are these people? <laughs> you know, they don't care about me. They're totally absorbed in their own trip. You know? And of course, that can be an enormous burden for a child to think that its parent just isn't interested in it. Now, obviously, we have configurations where we have left angle, left angle, right angle, right angle, and uh, you can intuit from that that you know there, there are basic differences in the way in which that's going to impact the way in which you think about the other. So, when you're looking at the relationship with your child, you also have to take in consideration the angle. It's something that's very important to see. But nothing is a greater advantage in understanding the possibilities of your child and how you can measure their well-being than profile because it tells you so much i mean it just does you know you have a first line child you know you have a responsibility to educate it you know you have a responsibility to provide it with as much security as you possibly can if you provide a first line child with a good education and security they're going to be well balanced in this life you know if you have a, a second line child you know that comes into this world allow them their space I mean, allow them their space and allow them to be able to develop their gifts without saying, wow, you're so good, you could become this. Just allow them their space. And if you have a third-line child, you know that you have a great discoverer on your hand. But you also know that they're going to have to confront the most difficult aspects of life. That they're going to have to deal with things that don't work, things that go wrong. You know, that it's very clear to them that, you know, they're the first children that understand that fairy tales are just that. They're fairy tales. They're not real. And yet the magic of that, the magic of that when you know that that's your child, how you can encourage that child to see the discovery in every error, to see the potential of every mistake, to see the good fortune in being able to grasp experience at such a deep level. You know, this is the, the, the lower trigram self-absorbed child. You know, they need to be into their stuff. They need to have their space of their own. They need to be able to handle mistakes and problems. And if you understand that, well, it's so easy. I mean, it's so easy. You know, I don't know about the security part. Obviously, there are so many places in the world where for a first line being to have education and security isn't necessarily something that's guaranteed and obviously you're going to end up with children that are insecure and fearful and so forth and so on. And there are parents who can't stand having a second line child, uh, a child that wants to withdraw into its own space, a child that puts up barriers and filters people out of its space. You know, if they don't understand it, they're not going to appreciate it. You know, they're going to, then they're going to think the child has a problem. You know, he doesn't want to socialize, he doesn't want to come out of his room. Uh, you know, all of these things. And the same thing with the third line. The third line just about, you know, as much as anything because of so many sixth line beings going through a third line phase in the first part of their process. You know, this whole business of uh, mistakes and uh, how mistakes are treated, how errors are treated, um, how easy it is to disturb children. I mean, it's so easy. You know, take a 3-5 child, you know, and punish it for a mistake that it's helpless in without giving it any encouragement to see why it happened and how it cannot happen again and how much they've learned to be able to now be able to tackle the very same thing. I mean, how devastating that is with the fifth line unconscious that, you know, the, the, the expectation that they're going to be able to solve every problem is suddenly broken and other people think less of them and they have to go around with a destroyed reputation and they're only two or three years old. I mean, it's very easy to destroy children. I mean, it's so easy to destroy their psyche. I mean, after all, all of you went through that. I mean, you all know. You know what it's like not to be treated according to your nature. I mean, you know that. It's, it's just the way that it is. You know, and the third line being, I mean, uh, this is such magic. I mean, it's such magic. Because there's so much that's possible. And yet to understand that you can't help them with their suffering. You know, they got to go through it themselves. This is their power. They're self-absorbed. It's their destiny that they have to fulfill on their own. And you have to encourage the lower trigram to recognize that, you know, to be ready to do it on their own, to stand on their own and to stand on their own regardless of their strategy. I mean, you can stand on your own as easily in response, matter of fact, even more so, you know, than, than in any other configuration. When you're dealing with the upper trigram, you have a whole difference. Now, of course, obviously, when you get to the fourth line, you're not necessarily getting to the left angle, nor juxtaposition, for that matter, because you have the 4-6. And, of course, the 4-6 closes the right angle process, but in essence, it is so transpersonal. 
And of course, this is one of the, the things about having a fourth line child is the recognition that you have enormous social responsibilities with a fourth line child. You know, you, you have to recognize that, first of all, you have to make sure that they really grasp things because they're, they're, you know, their gift is not the study, their gift is the delivery. I mean, they're, they're very good at you know, social interaction, but it, it is from a very, very personal, self-absorbed process. And one of the responsibilities in having a fourth-line child is that the need to develop a relationship with that child that is a f- almost a friendship relationship as a parent. In other words, uh, to be able to communicate with them successfully, this is a child that needs the parent's friendship in order to blossom. And of course, if the parent goes against that friendship, if it moves out of the friendship into an authoritarian process, you're going to have a deep reaction from that fourth line child. It's going to be very uncomfortable. The other thing is that because of its social gifts, that the fourth line child needs the opportunities of a social life. You know, if you have a four six as an example, and you raise them on a little farm in the middle of Kansas where, you know, uh, once in a blue moon they, they get to see a lot of people, it's very difficult for them. I mean, their whole life is going to be based on being able to network and being able to integrate with others. But the, the whole process of friendship is the real root of the relationship. Uh, to be their friend and to be an honest friend in that sense is something that, that can be so important for them and healthy. When you're dealing with a 4-1, when you're dealing with juxtaposition, um, juxtaposition children, uh, you know that they are exactly where they're supposed to be in that sense. Um, in other words, uh, it, it is one of the things to see about them. Obviously, they carry a first line. Obviously, they're going to need to take in things at a deep level in order to be secure. And there's nothing more difficult than having the first line at the unconscious level. Because the first line at the unconscious level is that you're dealing with unconscious fears, which means that you don't necessarily know what they are or how to deal with them. So when you're dealing with uh, the 4-1 and, and ultimately the 5-1, you know, it's one of those things to keep in mind uh, about these children is the deep sense of insecurity that they have that isn't necessarily ameliorated by the way in which they think. And here you have this combination that is very, very rigid and fixed in the way it works. So, you know, these are children that if you give them a, a, a generally solid environment, you're basically letting them grow up themselves. In other words, they're basically raising themselves. You'll see they're very good at it because they have this very fixed line. Now, obviously, we're not ta- taking into consideration their design in this. We're just talking about their, their profile, which is ultimately their purpose. And remember, you don't get to fulfill your purpose until you deal with the characteristics of your design, which is another story. Left angled children. Um, when you're dealing with the five, you're dealing with a child that is naturally going to be paranoid. So it's just something to deal with. You know, you're dealing with a child that, um, because it is very much aware of expectation and has already suffered from expectation, that it, it can become very suspicious. So one of the things about the, the fifth line child is don't put any expectations on the child and don't put up a scoreboard. You know, don't keep score. Well, you blew that one. Well, you blew that one. I mean, don't keep score with them. And it's one of the healthiest things, particularly for the five two. You know, because this is a very difficult combination. And we need five twos in this final, uh, yeah, this final time of uh, fifth line teaching. You know, we need five twos to complete the, the, the process of the call. And they're deeply reticent to do so, mostly because the failed expectation and the second line unconscious has made it very, very difficult for them to truly step out and present what is necessary in terms of what their specific heresy is. And so one of the things to develop with the the fifth line being is the the nurturing of their sense of well-being. In other words, the nurturing of the this, yeah, you don't have to get it right all the time for us you know if 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 you get it right most of the time we're going to think that you're terrific because after all the whole thing about the fifth line is that because they have 
and face expectation. Their friends think they can be the best friend, uh, you know, and on and on, uh, until they truly understand that that expectation is placed on them, and until they truly see that if they're operating correctly to, towards their, in terms of their design, that's when they're going to be able to operate heretically in a way that is going to be healthy. So it's a real process with them. The advantage is their left angle. They will find allies in this life. And finally, of course, we're dealing with the six, and when you're dealing with the six, you're dealing with the tripartite process here in looking at the parenting version of this. And, of course, uh, you're dealing with the Saturnian stage, so you're dealing with the third-line theme. How important it is to see that six-line children are the most vulnerable of all children. I mean, they're the most vulnerable of all children. Uh, mistakes can really cost them. Errors can really cost them, much more than for a natural third-line being who's born to be able to deal with it and grasp it. And so, you know, the, the, the good die young and all of these things that are associated with the Saturnian phase, one has to be very, very nurturing with, with the six-line child. And that nurturing is based on one thing and one thing only. It's based on trust. Don't ever break their trust. And as long as your six-line child trusts you, then you can help them go through what is a very vulnerable stage, that is the third-line stage of the six-line process. Um, again, you have to put all of that into context. That is, you have to put that into the context of their definition. And finally, to put it into the context of their not-self. In other words, where they are open in their design and to understand the way in which their minds work according to their not-self strategy. Particularly, this is very, very important when you're dealing with the solar plex center, the heart center, and the sacral center. Obviously, with the solar plex, you're dealing with um, children when they have an open solar plex center who are obviously very susceptible to the emotional wave. It's very important for the, the parent that carries the emotional wave, a, as an example, to recognize their impact on the child, to be clear about that. It's one of the advantages of having your own space. I mean, if you're an emotional parent and, and you're having a lousy day, well, you know, go into your own space. You know, keep your aura away from everybody else. Don't put that aura into the other. There's no need to do so. This is the integrity of space. It's one of the things that's so important. And obviously, these children with undefined emotional systems, you know how their not-self operates. You know they want to avoid confrontation and truth. So you must never let them avoid confrontation and truth. It's just that confrontation and truth are not to be emotional poison. You know, you have to find a way, you have to find a way to get to the source of whatever the thing is that has to be dealt with. But of course, if you're, if the child is operating correctly, if the child's being conditioned in a positive way, you know, it's being nurtured in a positive way, it's going to be so much easier for it to see and to understand. It does not have to run away from the emotional energy that it feels that it takes in from the other. I'm much more concerned about the open heart center. The majority of human beings have an open heart center. Um, and the heart center brings um, a, a, a great deal of physical stress. It's a motor, after all. And um, to have an undefined heart center, it, it goes to the very core of the spirit of most human beings. That is a sense of not being of value. And uh, obviously the pressures that come with constantly feeling that you have to prove yourself. And of course it's obvious if you have a child with an open heart center, y you must never give them the impression that they have to prove themselves to you. It's so important. It's so important that you get that message across to them. It's so important that the, they get the message that they do not have to prove anything to anyone. You know, it really will save their psychic life. I mean, it will save that life. And it's one of the essential things for them to grasp about themselves. They don't have anything to prove. You know, they don't have to be this or that. They only have to be themselves. And you will love them particularly for being themselves because it's the perfect expression of them. You know, but the moment that they feel that they have something to prove, the moment that they're conditioned to think they have something to prove, you know, that's the moment that the sickness begins. And it's a sickness that's very, very difficult, very, very difficult to overcome. The open sacral center is only important within the context that I mentioned earlier, which is sleep. I mean, this is really something very important. Uh, the, the whole sleeping pattern of human beings is, is something that's so out of whack, um, aside from the fact that uh, it's only recently, when I say recently, the last couple of hundred years, 
that there's been enough uh, enough generalized wealth in the world that individual residences, individual rooms for the general public, individual rooms for children. This is something that, you know, for for most of human history was something that only the the, the leaders of tribes could afford or the very very wealthy could afford. So it's it's a real revolution, this revolution of space. And uh, the more integrity we give to that, the more importance we give to that, uh, the healthier we're all going to be. And sleep is one of these things. It's just a part of that. You know, if you don't go correctly into your own space, when it's right for you, you know, to go into sleep, if you're not alone, you know, then, then it's going to have a very deep impact on your physical system. And most of the things that people suffer from as what appear to be daytime illnesses and problems and aches and pains and, uh, you know, all the various uh, hip cliche diseases that emerge all the time, you know, the vast majority of this is simply sleep oriented. If you're not going to sleep properly as a generator, you're not regenerating correctly. And this is the whole thing about the generator. That motor has to go down to a very, very, very low level. In other words, it really has to go down to a deeply low level in order for it to start its regenerating process. You know, and, and you have to see that unless you get to that point of exhaustion, unless you're really, you know, unless these children are allowed the privilege of being themselves and being healthy. You know, and of course, when you add the unhealthiness of the way in which they're conditioned in their sleep pattern to the way in which they're conditioned in their consciousness, you know, it's no wonder that you have these children that have problems, children that are incredibly obese in the West. And I mean, it's not just America. I mean, uh, if, uh, they have this in Spain, which is unbelievable that they have uh, this enormous rising obesity weight. You know, there's this, this generalization of, of wealth and the misunderstanding of of the way in which beings operate, you know, the problems with with the personality, the overindulgence uh, w with with children, all of this stuff, it just goes back to simple things. It's about knowing their design. And it's only about understanding simple things about how you treat them according to their design. And it's not like you have to be a specialist or an analyst or any of those things to be able to impart this knowledge to your children or your friends so that they can impart it to their children. And that's really the task at hand. I mean, for me, this is the, the thing that matters the most, is that everyone who has ever been touched by this knowledge, that they will, in, in their lifetime, affect the lives of many, many children. And it is the way it needs to be. And so far, it is the way it seems to be. It's my, my great affection for uh, the many, many women that have been a part of human design throughout its history. Uh, the mothers who have taken this knowledge and seen the reality of it. It was just like a little while ago, all of us with our 3955 stories. Wasn't that incredible? And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's not just about that this is some kind of theoretical, intellectual, blah, blah, blah. These are real mechanics that we're seeing. And in understanding them, we don't have to panic that, you know, our child is only eating Cocoa Puffs. Well, okay, they're only eating Cocoa Puffs. I've had the same breakfast all, all, my, all my life. I mean, all my life, without, without variation, when I have to have variation, I get very upset because it's terrible. I mean, you know, this is... Uh, how how beautiful it is just to simply see it and let it be that, to nurture it so that you can discover later the magic of what it brings into the world because it brings this differentiated consciousness and potential of awakeness and